Good day family and welcome to our online service. We would just like to remind you that we have on-site services at church every Sunday at 10.30. Please join us. For all the children, please take note that there's children lesson material that is on our Facebook page as well as on our website. Please join us now for worship with Henry and his team.
just want to speak the name of Jesus And over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus You
From my side, Mariette Skitter, and I want to really welcome you to this service. Now remember, for you who are watching on the other side of the screen, we have unlocked. We are having church right here, and we can't wait to welcome you here with us at Doxadea Raslow English. Now we have a business event on Zoom coming up on the 19th and 20th of November. For all our businessmen and women, we want to invite you to register via Church Suite. Can't wait to see you there. Radiance is a course that we are launching next year for our young girls that have finished school but are not yet married. Now you might wonder, what will I learn in Radiance? The six months course is a course we will address topics like the identity of the young women, your purpose in life, relationships, and we will also have good socials together. I can't wait to welcome you there. Please register ASAP. Then we have our Christmas wish list launching very soon. Now every year we make a huge difference in the lives of so many people and this year is going to be no different. So we are launching five projects of which the first one is toward our essential workers. We really want to thank them for what they have done during this pandemic time. Then we will reach out secondly to our police in Virdabrug this year, we will tackle the gardens and beautify it. We have had a very long relationship with Virabrug Police Station and we want to continue that. Thirdly, we will reach out to Risuert, which is a home for our very senior citizens in society. And we are going to be handing out gifts to them and give them a big Christmas party. Fourthly, we will reach out to Club 21, which is a school for Down syndrome children. Now we want to reach out to the teachers and really thank them for what they are doing for our community as well as for our Down syndrome children. Fifthly, we will have our Love Box project and this is going to be an exciting one where we pack boxes full of goodies for kids and hand them out to the needy children of a few creches in our area. Now you might wonder, how can I become a part of this huge project? Well, firstly, we are trusting God for 100,000 Rand to make the first four projects work. So we are inviting you to give of your resources so that we can reach this mark and make a difference in the lives of these people. Secondly, your physical contribution of giving your talents and your time and your effort will be so much appreciated. Thirdly, we want to just let you know that the fifth project 
which is our love box project, will not be sourced from the 100,000. We are asking you as our partners to make boxes with the goodies and the items that we are going to treat these kids with. And you can find all the details on the web. Just go to the tab events and right there you will see exactly what, where, when and how. This is also a time of our service where we'll now generously give to God out of gratitude for what He has done for us. So the five ways of giving now appear on the screen. You are welcome to now give of your tithes and offering. Enjoy the service with us. We are starting a new sermon series and we will listen to Llewellyn now. Well, good day. It's so lovely to spend time with you right there in your home or wherever you are. We are starting off today with a brand new series. Um, I'm not a fan of Jesus. And I know some of you are thinking, what am I talking about? But I want to say I'm not a fan. And, but, but stick with me because I want to journey with you through this concept of I'm not a fan. But if I'm not a fan, what am I? And so a fan is described as the following. This is the definition that we find when we, when we talk about a fan. It says a person marked or motivated by an, in, by an extreme unreasoning enthusiasm or an enthusiastic admirer with no sacrifice. Somebody that admires somebody else, you know, a fan knows everything about his follower, whoever he, he, he fans, he knows everything about that person. He knows when their birthday is, he knows who they're married to, and if they're not married, knows exactly a lot of things, the whole pedigree of that person, but they are not willing to put down, down their lives for that person. And I think when it comes to Christians, we have a lot of fans of Jesus, Jesus had a lot of fans who cheered him on when things went well, but when things got tough and difficult, they distanced themselves and saying, I don't want to follow him. I don't want to be associated with him. And, and there's a lot of people that, that still sit in church who are still a fan of Jesus. And here's a few things that I just want to, you know, raise to your attention. And, and maybe the fans are, are the people that, you know, I go to church. My parents and grandparents were Christians. I have the, the, the small fish sticker or the bumper sticker that says I'm a Christian or the bumper sticker that says I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I belong to this. That's the fans that we are talking about. The fans, maybe you've repeated a prayer after a preacher. Maybe you've put up your hand once after a sermon. You have more than three Bibles. Um, you have attended churches, church camps and maybe your worship, your, your ringtone on your phone is a worship song. See, those are fans, and I can continue because a fan is sometimes people that says, listen, whenever I pray, I utilize more than five synonyms for God, and I express that, and, and just to let people understand that, man, I'm a big fan of God, and that's the reason how I pray. We see how maybe fans are people that kissed dating goodbye. Maybe the, the King James version of the Bible is the only one that you read. Maybe there's other things that a fan does. In, and maybe, you know, when I look at your Facebook status, it would say Christ follower because we have become religious in the fact that Jesus is my biggest fan. I'm the biggest fan of Jesus. And, and our benchmark when it comes to Christianity is normally I'm holier than my neighbor. I'm holier than the person next to me. I'm holier than the people that I work with because that has become my benchmark because I'm a big fan of Jesus. And you see, the crowds followed Jesus because of what he did for them. I want to take you onto a journey in on John chapter 6 where Jesus actually fed 5,000 people. We know what happened. Jesus was teaching and ministering to people and, and they, they were gathering there and, and while they were sitting, the Bible says that, that Jesus called his disciples and said, listen, these people are hungry. We need to feed them. But this is where it started. Listen to, to verse 1 and 2 in the Passion Translation. It says, After this, Jesus went to the other side of the lake at Tiber Tiberias, which is also known as the Lake Galilee. And a massive crowd of people followed him everywhere. 
They were attracted, listen, they were attracted by the miracles and the healings they've watched him perform. You see, a, a, a fan is somebody who does performance in, and I fan the person because it is amazing what the person has done in, and always have to keep up with the performance. If this performance is not better today, it needs to be much better next week. And the same in church, there's a lot of people that sit with the fan mentality because if the preacher is not performing, we're going to look for a different church. If the worship leader is not performing, we're going to look for a different church. But that's the reason why Jesus says they were attracted by the miracles and the healing of that, he, that he had performed. And I want to say this. We need to realize it was this very moment when Jesus, after he fed the 5,000, after he teached them, he fed them, and everyone was hungry, uh, the, everyone was too full, and they were fine. And, and they said, listen, maybe we should camp over because we have this big time fans around Jesus and just to be with him because we, we fan him. And so the next morning when they woke up, they had a huge surprise. They were looking, they were hungry and looking for the next breakfast meal. And maybe, you know, we're still ready for, for what's on the, uh, the lunch menu. But Jesus and his disciples left to the other side. You see, these people, the, the crowd, they missed the chance of ordering breakfast and really what's on the lunch menu. But Jesus stopped the whole all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet. He's not handing out meals anymore. It, it, there's no free meals anymore. And so we look in John chapter 6, oh, verse 24 to 26. He says this to them. Because they were after what he did for them and not who he is. And John chapter 6 verse 24 says, So when the people saw on the shoreline a number of boats from Tiberias and realized Jesus and his disciples weren't there, they got into the boat and went to Capernaum to search for him. When they finally found him, they asked him, Teacher, how did you get here? Jesus replied, this is so beautiful, let me make this clear to you. You came looking for me because I fed you by a miracle and not because you believed in me. You were looking for me because you're looking for a free meal. You're looking for me because you don't want to sacrifice your life, but you want something, to, to, something that I can do for you. You have what I want to call the consumer mentality. Somebody needs to do something for you. And Jesus said, I know this is the only thing that you're interested in, is the food, the free food, what, what is on the menu. And so listen to this in verse 35. It's so beautiful. Jesus said unto them, it's not what you're looking for, is who you're supposed to look for. And he says, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Come every day to me and you will never be hungry. Believe in me and you will never be thirsty. You see, when Jesus spoke to them at that very moment, it was as Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life and this, the only thing on the menu is myself. I'm on the menu. And so the crowd decided, they had to decide, are we going to stay or are we going to leave? Because we're not interested in someone. We are interested in something. We are interested in what you can do for us. We want to have something from you. And this chapter ended off with this following. It says, and so from that time, on many of the disciples, I want to say it's not the disciples. From that time on, because disciple means follower, not a fan. But that time, it says, and from that time, many of the fans turned their backs on Jesus and refused to be associated with him because it is something he couldn't do anything for them. They wanted the miracles. They wanted to, him to perform, but they were not looking for him. And it was the same fans who later on crucified him, who shouted the Messiah, the same fans who, who acknowledged him among the crowds, but in, the, in person, in relationship, rejected him when he couldn't do and no one wanted to do anything for them. 
And so there was a group of people who I believe was not fans, but followers. And verse 67 says, So Jesus said to his twelve, He says, Are you, and you, do you also want to leave? <laughs> and they realized, We don't want to leave, Jesus. You have handpicked us. We have followed you. We have left our families behind. We have sacrificed everything. We're not going anywhere. We're not attracted by your performance. We are not attracted by the miracles and the healings and, and the power and the manifestations that we see. The, the, we're, not, we're not attracted by that. We are attracted by you. You are our master. You're the person that we want to be with. Because Jesus was never impressed by the crowds, but the level of commitment of a person. That's the important part. And Jesus knew that we wanted to follow him because he handpicked us. He had handpicked you. But the question is, did you come to a place where you say, I'm leaving my old life, I'm leaving everything, and I'm following him because I'm not just a fan of Jesus. You see, there's more that I want to talk to you. Because there was a person in the Bible, in this same book of John, who was one of Jesus' biggest fans. The fan of all fans. You know, it's normally that fan where, where you see him on TV when there's a rugby match or soccer match on. It's that fan who paints himself the color of that sport, who's got the makaramba on his head, who, who's, who's there to support the people who support what they're going to do and mean for him and not what he meant for them. And when that fan, when, they, when his team win, you normally find him saying the following, we have won. How can you say we have won? You've done nothing. They were on the field. You were just doing your own thing. Some of us sit in front of the TV on Saturdays and, and watching rugby or soccer or whatever, and we eat ourselves to full. And then we say, we have done this. You've done nothing. It's sometimes time for us to stand up and follow Jesus. And so in John chapter 3, we read about a, a fan named Nicodemus. Uh, you should know that th this name Nicodemus, was, he was a well-known and well-respected man of God in his region. And, and he was a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, an elite group of community leaders and religious leaders. So this was this group of, of this body that, that belonged to the religious leaders. And they made certain rules and regulations. And, and Nicodemus belonged to them. So, so this Nicodemus was ready to take his relationship with Jesus to another level. This was the person, if you read, he, he was willing to say, listen, I know that I'm, I'm a well-known person in public. Uh, I would lose everything in public if I would say that I followed Jesus. What would people think and find out that Nicodemus was an admirer of this homeless a carpenter turned into a rabbi that actually comes from uh, the, the, the town, the small town, Nazareth. And, and at, at every least, how he, he would lose his position in the Sanhedrin. He would lose his position in the community and in this elite group and, and his reputation as a religious leader. This was the guy that, that think about all these things. And Nicodemus came to a crossroad where he would have to choose between his religion, his casual relationship, if I could say, versus his, his commitment relationship with Jesus. You see, there's, a, there's sometimes a way that we truly need to understand that we need to lose all religion if we want to follow Jesus. And Nicodemus was at that crossroad, understanding that I, although I have this status, although I'm a, I'm a scribe and, and a, a re religious leader, I need to get rid of all these things to follow Jesus. See, at that moment, he knew that he needs to define his relationship with Jesus, because his relationship with Jesus was not defined at that very moment. And Nicodemus made that move when he actually wanted to define his relationship. And the Bible says, this is what happened. In John chapter 3 verse 2, he, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night. 
He visited Jesus at night and it was easier to, to overlook this detail when, when we talk about Nicodemus and the inside of it. But you, we would understand that at night, that's when he wanted to visit Jesus. But Jesus don't want us only at night because he's the light of this world and he wanted us to be around him in the day as well. But he came to Jesus at night. At night, no one would see him. No one would, uh, uh, he would avoid all these questions about, you know, religious leaders and all the people. And, and at night, he could spend time with Jesus without anyone knowing, even his family, all his relationship with other people. No one would knew that, that Nicodemus is, was with Jesus. In fact, whenever Jesus was teaching, Nicodemus had the opportunity because he heard Jesus speaking and teaching and he had mostly the opportunity to go to Jesus and speak to Jesus. But he knew if people see him speaking to Jesus, they're going to know that he wanted to follow Jesus. And so Nicodemus distanced himself, although he... The compassion and the love and the, Jesus inspired him. He was an enthusiastic follower of Jesus. But it was still a fan. And that mostly was Nicodemus realized that I'm comfortable in my position, in my status. I don't want everything more. You see, a fan can, can know him without having any impact of influence or, 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 you know, nobody would know about it. Your friends don't see you and it will cost you nothing because you are just a fan. There's no commitment. You see, most of us, when it comes to this, you need to understand that most of us don't think that, don't mind when Jesus wants to make, make uh, minor changes to our lives. We don't mind. But Jesus is not in the business of making minor changes to your life. He wants to do, he wants to take your life upside down because he knows what your potential is all about. He says, fans, don't mind him doing a little touch up, but Jesus wanted to complete renovation. Fans come to Jesus thinking, tune me up. But Jesus wanted them to think and to realize, I'm going to overhaul you. Fans think uh, just a little makeup and a fine tune, but Jesus himself things make over fans think a little decoration is required but Jesus wanted to complete the model fans wanted Jesus to inspire them but Jesus wanted to interfere with your life and change your life upside down so that you can become the people and the person that God dreams over your life and so going to follow Jesus will cost you something the willingness to lay my life down, the willingness to, to say, Jesus, I know that I've been a fan for so many years. Maybe it's time for me to lay down my life and to commit in this relationship that I have with you. See, when you speak about this, we realize later in that chapter, when Nicodemus had to make this decision about Jesus, Jesus had a conversation with him. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I'm not, I don't want, I want to define our relationship, but the relationship that we have is only a fan relationship. I want to have an encounter relationship with you. I want to have a, a commitment, a committed relationship. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it's time for you to understand that you need to be born again. Nicodemus had to make this decision with Jesus. And Jesus wanted to tell him that I want us to have a proper relationship not just a casual one, a commitment relationship, a relationship that is committed to the ends of the world. And at that very moment, understanding that Nicodemus was actually a religious leader, he knew the first book of the, uh, the first five books of the Bible out of his head. He, he worked on his religious resume and here Jesus come and, you know, just mess everything up and Jesus throw his life upside down. He, Jesus are interested in relationship and not in your, real, in your religion. And so Jesus said to him, it's time for you to change. It's time for you to do something different. You see, we, we need to understand it's about the decision of following him. It's not just a decision that I'm making because sometimes we make a decision in saying, hey, I'm a believer, I've made the decision. But the question is, are we following Jesus? Yes, everyone can believe, we can believe in him. But the fact of the matter is, are we following him? Because Nicodemus also believed in Jesus. 
but no one could see that he's a follower. All the disciples who sticked with Jesus after he had fed, fed the 5,000, they followed him, they believed, but they also followed him until the day he died. No wonder John, the book of John speaks of believe. When Jesus said, believe in me, five times. But when Jesus said, follow me, more than 20 times, it must have telling us something that it is important to follow Jesus because the gospel is free, but it is not cheap. It is, what it's going to cost you something to lay down your life. It's going to cost your life to say, I'm ready to go and follow Jesus. And St. Nicodemus had a reality check. And I think sometimes for us as Christians, we need to have this reality check because we are silent when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. We are not expressive. People don't see us serving. People don't see us giving of ourselves. We sit in our chairs and we become holier. Oh, I'm holy because I'm better than this person. I'm better than that person. I have the bumper sticker on my... You have become a fan of Jesus and not a follower. And so we see from chapter 3, Nicodemus is silence. And it turns out that wasn't the last time that we hear of Nicodemus. In chapter 7, Nicodemus come back onto the scene. The next time we meet him in chapter 7, he is confronted with the popularity of Jesus that he knew that Jesus become popular and the Sanhedrin wanted to find a reason to silence Jesus because he became popular in talking. In, he became the talk in the, in the town and Nicodemus could say anything, but he believed in Jesus in his head. He believed that Jesus was the Son of God and the, the elite group wanted to silence Jesus. They wanted this reason, but Nicodemus wanted to avoid them to do it. And John chapter 7 verse 50 says the following. It says, Nicodemus who had previously come to Jesus. Remember, previously come to Jesus at night. Who was one of them. One of who? One of the elite group. Then said to them. Now you need to understand. You can see the tension building up here. Because these people are sitting in a, an, uh, in a round table. And they're sitting there and discussing. How are we going to take this guy on? What is he going to do? And this is what he says. He says, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him out? What has he has, what has been doing? Can, can't we just hear him out what he's busy doing? We just want to take him on. And suddenly the, the tension was, and the focus was never, not again on Jesus at that very moment. And the attention moved to Nicodemus and everyone looked at him and they asked this question, are you also from Galilee? Are you from Galilee too? Tell us, are you also a follower now? Are you also looking for this? And, and the Bible goes on, it says, look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Look in it. Nicodemus, can't you see that a prophet can't come out of Nazareth, this small town, this town of insignificant? The question is, can something good come out of Nazareth? Yes, something good can. And it doesn't stop there with Nicodemus. But later on, we see how Nicodemus' life has changed. Because that very question, are you also from Galilee, put the spotlight on him and he's his whole status, his religion mindset, everything that he wanted to protect was out of the way because it's either he protect himself or he protect Jesus and following Jesus. And he chose at that very moment when he says, does the law condemn a man to first hear him out? When Nicodemus said that and the whole elite group asked the question, are you also from Galilee? Meaning that I'm willing not to protect my own status, but Jesus because I'm willing to follow him. And later on, when Nicodemus chooses to follow Jesus, things have changed. Nicodemus never visited Jesus at night anymore, but during the day. And in John chapter 19, verse 39, at the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus, the Bible says, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus once at night, also came and brought a mixture of about 50 liters of myrrh and aloes. This was expensive. 
expensive. It cost him something. It, only, it didn't only cost him money, but it cost him his status in a community. It cost him people. It cost him his other relationships because he was willing to follow Jesus. And I want to end off with this scripture. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, we all know this. We've heard this before, but it says, Then he said to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be a follower, not a fan, will listen to this, must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to be saved will lose their, it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. The message translation says, Then he told them what they could expect from themselves. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You not in the driver's seat. I am. Follow me and I will show you how. Verse 24, self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way. You need to sacrifice to follow Jesus. This is my way to find yourself, your true self. Verse 25, what good would it be? What good would it, uh, would it do to get everything you want and lose it to the real you? If any of you is embarrassed with me and the way I'm leading you now, that the Son of Man will be far more embarrassed with you when he's arrived at all splendor in the company of his Father and the holy angels. This isn't your realized pie in the sky, by and by. Some who have been taken their stand right here are going to see it happen see with their own eyes the kingdom of God. Some of us who are taking a stand today and saying, I'm not a fan of Jesus. I'm not an enthusiastic person without sacrifice, but I'm sacrificing my life to follow Him. No matter the cost, I'm doing it right now. I'm not a consumer. I'm a contributor. I want to show people that I'm passionate about Jesus. And today, I want to say, I'm Lou Allen, and I'm not a fan of Jesus. I'm a contributor. I'm a follower. I'm willing to lay my life down. What is your choice this morning? What do you choose? Are you only making a decision to protect yourself, or are you making a decision this morning in following Jesus? Just where you are, bow your heads, and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to bless each and everyone listening to me that you will give them the capacity to follow you. Give them strength to lay down their old life and follow the new way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
melted my shame and turned it around. Oh, you lifted me up. Your love chased me down. Your love took my shame. Thank you so much for being part of our service today. If you are not yet part of Doxada Raslo campus and you would like to become a partner, please send an email to Llewellyn. His email address is now on the screen. If you have a prayer request and you would like someone to pray with you, please send a WhatsApp to the number that's now on the screen. If you would like any other information regarding Doxada Roslo campus, please go visit our Facebook page as well as our Doxada Roslo website. Have an awesome week and see you guys next week.